Father, the greatest thing in the world is to be a Christian. We are so thankful to be saved. And now, Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on this moment of the word and that I would be kept from error and speak the truth in the power of your might and that ears would be granted and that unbelievers in this room would be brought out of darkness into light and that saints would be made strong and that pastors would be made to not lose heart, but that they would be refreshed and able to hold fast to the word without tampering with it and that as their outer nature is wasting away, hastened by the battles of ministry, they would be renewed day by day, looking to the things that are unseen. So God, do this in a thousand more things that none of us in this room can think to ask right now, because that's just the way your word works. I pray for this in Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles, please, if you have one, to 2 Corinthians 4. We're going to read the whole chapter, and I'm going to do my best to trace Paul's thought through the entire chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, We would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been, what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So let's walk step by step, verse by verse, through the chapter, attempting to follow the train of thought, and then step back when we've done that and clarified the main point or the double main point and then encourage ourselves with the seven arguments 
that are here supporting the main point. And I promise you, the main point and the seven supporting arguments are massively encouraging and relevant to your ministry. Verse 1, therefore, we'll come back to that therefore later, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we're going to come back to that later, we do not lose heart. That is repeated in verse 16, you noticed? So we do not lose heart. I think that's going to be the main point of the chapter. A little bit qualified by adding a second aspect of it you'll see in just a moment. Question number one. What is it about this moment in this book that would incline Paul to be disheartened, to lose heart? Why would he say this? What what has prompted this? In chapter 2, verse 15, he said that his ministry is the aroma of Christ, and to some, it's the aroma of death to death. That's a horrifying thing. He preaches, and the effect of his preaching is that dead people are confirmed in their deadness forever. The gospel meets with deadness, and sentences people to death. And then in chapter 3, even though he's celebrating the superior glory of the new covenant ministry that lifts the veil and shows the glory of God in Christ, he says in verse 14 of chapter 3, to this day, when they, my kinsmen, read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. So the aroma of death to death and a ministry of unlifted veils, that's disheartening, and you know it. You pour your life out pleading, and they don't live, they don't even understand, they don't see any glory at all. I think that's why he has to battle losing heart. He loves his kinsmen. He would die for them, according to Romans 9, and they're not believing. He walks into synagogue after synagogue, he preaches his heart out, and Five or ten people follow him and 50 walk away. Now, that statement, we do not lose heart, is not just a statement about his emotions. There's a logic between verse 1 and verse 2. I hope your Bibles are still open because I want to show you what I see. See if you can figure it out. The the Greek is Allah or Al, but we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with the word of God. So what's the implication of putting those two back to back? We don't lose heart, we don't tamper. But we don't tamper. We don't lose heart, but we don't tamper. What's the logic? I think the implication is when you don't get the response you so long to get, the temptation is huge to change your message. If the veil doesn't go up, if life is not replaced with deadness, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to do something. And, And the way he says it is, we don't lose heart, 
But we don't try to fix it this way. And the rest of the chapter is how to fix it, how to manage your, your heart loss. Not that way. That's the double main point. Don't lose heart and don't fix heart loss this way. That's the double main point of the chapter. Don't tamper with the message in order to keep from losing heart when you don't get the response you want. Let me read it again. We do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. I love Paul. I love the Apostle Paul. So open, just absolutely transparent in everything he does, everything he says. So our statement, our gospel, is an open statement of the truth. No cunning, no tampering, no underhandedness, nothing slippery, no double talk. There's no clever attempt to make difficult doctrines other than they are. No effort to be squishy about the clear moral teachings of the Bible. I knew a denominational official who said to a young pastor who was struggling with how to preach Romans 9 in his church, and the denominational official said, oh, there's a way to preach Romans 9 so the people don't know what you think. <laughs> My hatred is large for that advice. I can't believe people like that lead churches and denominations. This is the opposite of we're open, we're an open book. My life is open, my message is open, everything is open. I have no secrets in this pulpit in my life. Be like that. Be like the Apostle Paul, not like that terrible denominational official. So verses three and four give the real explanation now for why not everybody believes when he preaches. The reason is not that he's obscure. It's not that he's not open. I mean, if you, if you preach in confusing ways, that would explain maybe why some people don't believe. They don't understand what in the world he's talking about. He, he just doublespeak. Nothing's plain here. And he says, that's not the way we are. Well, what, what's the explanation then for why they're not believing? Verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, which it is, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of God. So what's the point? What's the logic between verses 1 and 2 and 3 and 4? The point is that the unbelief of those behind the veil, for whom the veil is not being lifted, for whom deadness is being confirmed, the point is that their deadness and their lack of sight is not owing to Paul's failure to be clear and open and honest, transparent and forthright and not underhanded but bold and plain. It's not that. It's not cunning, not tampering. What is it? It's that they have been judged by God and abandoned to perishing. They are the perishing. That language is, is used. Chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Or chapter 2, verse 15, death to death to those who are perishing. Strange way to solve the problem of discouragement, namely the doctrine of reprobation.
If you don't come to terms with the sovereignty of God as the final explanation for the discouragements of your life, you won't survive. You just won't survive, even in your own family. Next argument, verse 5. Notice the word at the beginning, for. For, so he's supporting now, the verses 3 and 4. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. In other words, the failure of people to see the glory of Christ, in verse 4, the failure of people to see the glory of Christ in our preaching is not because we don't preach Christ. We haven't started preaching Paul. We haven't started preaching ourselves. We're just holding up Jesus Christ as Lord. We are part of the ministry for sure, but we're way, we're down here like slaves serving. So that's our ministry. That's our double ministry. We preach Christ, not ourselves, and ourselves as your slaves. That that forms the double ministry track for the rest of this chapter, you'll see those two dimensions of ministry. Our verbal message, our bodily, slave-like ministry is not the reason the veil is unlifted. And then comes argument number verse 6. For Why do you preach like that? Why why do you lift up Christ? Why do you assume the role of a slave? Why do you not preach yourself for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, way back at the beginning, the creation of the world. He's done that same thing. He's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, the reason we preach Christ And the reason we assume a servant-like, slave-like role in this ministry, including clay pot-like suffering, is because when God shines into the light of a dead heart and opens their eyes, what they see is the glory of God in the face of Christ in Paul's ministry, his verbal ministry and his Christ-like suffering ministry. Those are the two things. If he, if he didn't lift up Christ and act like Christ, when the eyes were open, what would they see? So that's the reason he preaches that way. That's the reason verse 6 starts with because. So the point of verses 1 to 6 is that Paul does not let discouragement overwhelm him. He he doesn't let it lead to tampering with the Word of God, verse 2. He doesn't pull back from Christ-like, lowly, slave-like service. Rather, he takes his encouragement from the sovereignty of God, both in those who are perishing and in those in whose Hearts, he sheds saving light. Verse 3, verse 6. The fact that Paul has the ministry as a gift, that's verse 1. This ministry is a gift, Paul. The ministry of death is a gift. The ministry of life is a gift. It's a gift of mercy. That will underline for us, understrike our sense, I don't lose heart here. I have a gift from God. It's a ministry. It's it's a horrible and glorious ministry as you become the death and life of people. Now, verses 7 to 12. Here in 7 to 12, he focuses on the slave-like, lowly, servant ministry of verse 5. So verse 5 has two pieces. We preach Christ as Lord, and we take the position in our ministry of being underneath you, Corinthians, serving you in every way imaginable to lift you up 
We're not lording it over you. We're under you like slaves or like pots, clay pots, jars of clay. He gets down low, he gets underneath, he serves the people, he foregoes rights. I mean, you know the Corinthian correspondence. He doesn't take rights, he doesn't take privileges, he doesn't take remuneration, he doesn't let himself get enough sleep, he, he loses safety, he loses esteem. That's what it means to be an apostle or maybe a pastor. And that second dimension of Christ-likeness is what these verses are about. So he's carrying forward the argument by spelling out what that looks like. Not disgraceful, not manipulative, not underhanded, not cunning, not tampering with God's word, clear message, and sacrificial life in devotion to his people. So verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Now the treasure I take to refer to verse 6, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So that's happened to Paul. Light has gone on. He has seen the glory of God, the glory of Christ. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So what does it mean to be a clay pot or a jar of clay? And I don't think we need to step back, close our eyes and speculate. We just need to read verses eight and nine. So let's do that. We are afflicted in every way. We are crushed. I didn't read that right. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. So to be a clay pot or to be a jar of clay is to be vulnerable to affliction, perplexity, persecution, being knocked down. I think that's what he meant in verse 5. We're your slaves. We'll endure anything for your salvation. Then, in verses 10 and 11, he connects the servant-like suffering with how that reveals Christ. He's not just suffering willy-nilly. He's not a jar of clay for nothing. It's, it's, self, it's saving. It's a saving suffering. So let's read it. Always carrying in the body this jar of clay, afflicted, perplexed, struck down, persecuted body, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. All his suffering is a portrayal of how much Jesus suffered for them. Same thing he taught in Colossians 1.24. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Whoa. Oh, pastors, the implication here for your suffering is staggering. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh, this fleshly, clay pot, dying, suffering, afflicted, knocked down body in pastoral ministry is all about giving life to your people. All pastoral suffering is for their life. What you do with your suffering will show the life of Jesus. This is totally different than the prosperity gospel understanding of the ministry. 
or almost any other conceivable description of the gospel ministry. It's very bleak and very glorious. <laughs> to, to be a pastor, if you're a, if you're a young aspiring pastor here, you better watch out and be careful. This is it. Carrying in the body the death of Jesus means being afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down for Jesus' sake. He is embodying, embodying for the world to see what Jesus was like, a man of suffering, dying, he's dying for his people, and Paul is slowly dying for his churches. The life of Jesus is being manifested in our mortal, dying flesh. This is why verse 6, when God shines into the unveiled blind heart, what they see is the face of Jesus. When God, in Paul's ministry, lifted the veil or took away the blindness and their eyes were opened, they saw Paul and Jesus suffering. The effect of this clay pot, servant-like weaknesses, um, being afflicted, crushed, perplexed, struck down, is threefold, three effects. Number one, the life of Christ is manifested, verse 10 and 11. Number two, death is at work in us, but life in you, so not only is the life of Christ manifested, it causes life. Paul's bodily representation of Jesus brings life. God uses it to bring life, according to verse 12. And third, the third effect is that God is the one who gets the glory. That was the logic of verse 7, right? We have this treasure in jars of clay so that the surpassing power, when people get saved get life, the life of Jesus is manifest and they get life, might belong to God and not to Paul. Oh my goodness, the implications for pastoral ministry. Then in verses 13 to 15, what's happening? How does he advance the argument now? He steps back and surprisingly, I mean, takes me off guard, surprisingly, he aligns himself with the psalmist who wrote Psalm 116. Huh, where did that come from? It's as though he wants to say, hey, I'm not the first person who embraced suffering and stayed true to the message in spite of death and suffering and didn't tamper with the Word of God. I'm not the first person to to do this. I'm not the first person to speak because you believe and not tamper and face death. I'm I'm not the first person. You're not the first person. We're in a big line here. So here's verses 13 and 14. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to Now, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, now the next words are a direct verbal quote from Psalm 11610 in the Septuagint. I believe, and so I spoke. We also believe. We're in line. We're like the psalmist here. I believe, and I also spoke. And he says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. Let me read it carefully. 
knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Now, here's the context in the psalm. I'll read it to you. This is Psalm 116. Select verses from 3 to 10. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. You delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed and therefore I spoke. That's the context. So Paul knew that often in the Old Testament, those who suffered gained strength from believing in fellowship with God beyond suffering and even beyond death. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And so Paul says in the same way, I press on in my painful, apostolic, disheartening ministry because, verse 14, I know that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Then in verse 15, he adds two more arguments for why he continues to speak and continues to suffer without tampering with the word and without tampering with Jesus' example in his life. Verse 15. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. In other words, his ministry of truth and love, word and deed, speaking and suffering, is in fact leading people by grace out of death into life and into God-exalting thankfulness. And since God's exalting power is the reason, according to verses 6 and 7, then that causes people to give thanks and he gets the glory. So the two added arguments are, in verse 15, one, people are getting grace from this ministry, so don't lose heart, don't tamper with the word of God. Lots of people are getting grace. Some are being consigned to destruction, but lots of people are getting grace. And number two, God is getting thanks. God is getting glory. <coughs> Therefore, now we're at verse 16, last paragraph. Therefore, he repeats his main point. We don't lose heart. And he says this, knowing full well that this kind of ministry is costing him his life. You need to hear that. If you say, Pastor, if you say, this ministry is killing me, that's no reason to stop. <laughs> it's designed that way. Seriously. And that's where the last paragraph goes. He does not mean for your life to be easy. Not emotionally easy, not easy in the family, not easy in the church, not easy in the community, not easy in your health. Where did we get the idea that ministry should be easy? Paul's whole life was suffering. I mean, 2 Corinthians is simply breathtaking in how much he suffered. It was relentless, absolutely relentless. I mean, if I go through a, a little season of suffering, I get, ugh. I mean, I always say Monday's coming, you know, kind of like kickback on Monday. There was no kickback for Paul. He just never let up. So he finishes the chapter by explaining why his wasting away does not cause him to lose heart. 
First, it's because he experiences renewal every day. Let's go back. I should read it, I suppose. Though our outer nature, our outer self, is wasting away. Verse 16. Now, I know that's true of all human beings, and generally we take it that way. I'm 78, good grief. I am wasting away. And you are too. You don't feel it as much, but we're wasting away. Eyes, hearing goes first usually. I got hearing aids on right now. I always wonder whether they put this microphone, microphone on like this. It's going to make my hearing aids fall off. Isn't that a little silly ego thing? That's the way it is. We're all wasting away. However, that's not Paul's drift here. In the pastorate, it goes faster. And it's meant to. You're wasting away, pastor. And part of it is the pastorate is a wasting. It's hard. It's relentless. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. That's his argument for why he doesn't lose heart in this paragraph. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. Now, how does that happen? That means in the hardest days of your life, if you're like Paul, you'll go to bed, you'll hardly be able to sleep, and you'll get up in the morning, and he's found a way to be new. His mercies are new every morning. You know, Jesus said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Every day has its evil and its mercies. There's the genius of renewal. Got to find a way in the midst of constant, relentless pressure and being cast down and knocked down every morning to find out, how do I get new? I want to be nude today. I can't carry all that mess from yesterday into today. If I do, I can't be of any use to anybody. I must be renewed. How did he do it? It happens because he's totally convinced of verse 17. This light Momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So for Paul, his countless and lifelong afflictions are light and momentary by comparison to something. The key to your life, brothers, is heavenly mindedness. Don't let anybody ever tell you the hellish sentence that being heavenly minded makes you no earthly good. It was the power of his earthly good. He couldn't have survived if he didn't believe. It's all going somewhere. Every pain is a stroke in the reward of the weight of glory. He believed it. Do you believe it? Or are you so earthly minded, you got to have payback now? I hate retirement for that reason. Americans are taught that you work 40, 30 years, and then you play for 20 years. You deserve it. It's the reward. That's overrealized eschatology. <laughs> it's a total misplacement of heaven. Paul totally believed in retirement. It starts at death. (laughs) And it's glorious. I mean, so glorious, an eternal weight of glory that so exceeds any suffering here. He could keep going. He got new every morning with the hope of glory. So you've got to be heavenly minded, guys. You've just got to get out of your head all hope of earthly reward. They may come. They may not come. He will strike you down over and over again to wean you off this world. He will, because he loves you very much. He wants you to serve fruitfully like Paul did.
Romans 8, 18, compared to eternity, these light momentary afflictions are incomparable to the weight of glory that's coming to us. So he ends now by telling us his secret. So what's your secret, Paul? How do you do it? Verse 18, we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I do it because of where I look, which now brings me to the therefore at the beginning of the chapter. You got it? I bet you got it in your head. I bet some got you in your head. Because you know what's immediately before the therefore, verse 1. We, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being changed from one degree of glory to the next. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, we don't lose heart. And here, it's, we look to the things that are unseen. The things that are unseen are eternal. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Now, let's step back. Um, so here's what we're going to do for the remaining few minutes. We're going to restate the main point. It's my effort to walk through the logic of the chapter. Let's restate the main point and then just go step by step and name the seven arguments that you didn't count probably, but I did. because That's my job. <laughs> and each one, let it build to make you not lose heart. I want you to go home and just walk out of here saying, I'm not going to lose heart. I don't care what happens. I'm not going to lose heart in the ministry. That's the effect I think Paul, if he were watching right now, would want to happen. So, the main point, as I said earlier, is this, is this double effect of the relationship between verse 1 and verse 2. We don't lose heart, repeated down in verse 16, but we don't tamper. We don't lose heart, but we don't tamper, meaning there are reasons in the ministry to lose heart, but we don't solve that problem by changing our message. That would be a great temptation. People are not responding. People are not getting saved. The veil is not being lifted. The hardness is not being removed. The death is not being replaced with life. God, I want a fruitful ministry. And his answer is, don't you change my gospel. Don't you change anything here. You tell with an open statement of the truth and nothing underhanded what I have communicated to you. And you bring your life into conformity to Jesus. That's the main point. Now, what are his supporting arguments? Number one, when your gospel remains revealed or Veiled, remains veiled, so that people you love, maybe in your own family, do not believe. It need not be owing to your mishandling of the truth. It may be owing, verse 3, to the fact that they are perishing. It was veiled to those who are perishing. And he meant that to be stabilizing for Paul. The sovereignty of God in the salvation of sinners should be stabilizing. I can't manage this. I can't control this. I can't tinker with the, with the word of God to fix this. This is of God. This is a miracle. Oh, that churches believe that being saved is a miracle. How we would sing differently, amazing grace, if we believed our salvation is an absolute sovereign miracle. So, argument number one for not being downcast or discouraged is because your message is not the problem. My sovereignty, it decides who gets saved. Number two, when you are afflicted in every way, let that phrase sink in, afflicted in every way, verse 10, every way, guys. So, so they say, oh, this only has to do with, you know, 
Persecution, being whipped, 39 lashes, or being thrown in prison. No, it's stress at home. It's kids that break your heart. It's cancer. It's people walking out of the church after you preached on election. It's just all kinds of things. Every way. We are afflicted in every way imaginable. Perplexed, persecuted, struck down. And here's the encouragement. In and through that, the death of Jesus is embodied and the life of Jesus spreads. That's the way it comes. The life of Jesus comes through your suffering. Number, number three, this is verse 12. In spite of the sorrows of those who don't believe, many brothers are going to see. They're going to see and believe. Grace is going to come to them. They're going to receive grace. Grace. And when they receive grace, they're going to live. And when they live, they're going to give thanks. And when they give thanks, God's going to get the glory. And, and it will reverberate to your everlasting credit in heaven. Number four, since you must uh, take the role of a jar of clay in your weakness, your afflictions, don't forget there's a design in it. And the design is so clear in verse 7. That the surpassing power might belong to God and not to us. Um, sometimes I, I you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't talk in front of a group. And, and now I've spoken in front of like 60,000 students at Passion. And I remember I, I, would, I would feel some of the old paralyzing heartbeats, thinking how, how I would let God down if I messed it up in front of a, an arena full of students. And one year, I, I just said to myself, I'm going to recite the entire chapter of Revelation 5 to start the passion message. I'm not going to look down. I'm not even going to have it in my notes. I'm risking it. I'm going to trust Jesus. Recite in front of all these students. And I said to the Lord, if I stumble and I cannot remember how to go on, turn it for your glory. And I think that's the way it works. I think if God wants to show my clay pottishness, he could do it any way he wants. That, that isn't the way he's done it usually in my life. I, I've never... Um, had to stop in the middle of a message because I couldn't remember what to say. But, oh, there are other parts of my life that are so sad. So you got your ways, and yours will be different. Your place will be different. Number five, never let anybody persuade you that being heavenly-minded makes you no earthly good. Paul's heavenly mindedness here, that is his absolute confidence in and eagerness for the resurrection of the body, sustained him in his wasting away, his pastoral wasting away, not just his geriatric wasting away. He believed and he spoke and he suffered, knowing, this is verse 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. That's the ground for why he spoke when he believed. Is it operative, men? Is it operative for you? I will be raised. I used to say to our anxious elders at the end of the year when we were making our finances, they're all anxious. I said, look, guys, what's the worst thing that could happen? And I said, uh, I said, okay, guys, the worst thing that would happen is that we all just drop dead right now. <laughs> and that's not a problem. <laughs> so if that problem is taken care of, why are you anxious about the rest? Seriously. Get your guys, get, get, get people to believe in the resurrection of the dead. They'll become lion-hearted. 
They'll take all kinds of risks for Jesus if they believe in the resurrection of the dead. Number six, two more. God has for each of you a daily renewal for the inner man. Verse 16. He does. He's not going to leave you without it. God has a daily renewal for the inner man. It comes from the hope of the weight of glory and makes present afflictions light and momentary. You just have to get your mind right. You know, the world is just totally, constantly getting your mind all crazy. And just get your mind clear. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to be raised from the dead. I'm going to get the reward for all of my faithful ministry. This is glorious. What a great work. Whatever suffering is required of me. Every day, every day, get alone with God and behold. We look not to the things that are seen. So you got to turn off all the, all the devices, right? And, and you've got to be careful what you watch at night. I mean, good grief how many pastors are just destroyed by what they watch on the streaming services. It's so worldly. I mean, oh, well, I won't watch any nudity. But everything else is worldly. Everything else is worldly. And they soak in their brain night after night and think they're going to have the power of God on their lives. So we look to the things that are not seen, or as verse 18 of chapter 3 says, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being changed. And then finally, number seven, we're not alone in this. Psalmists, prophets, apostles, thousands of saints who lived and served faithfully, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, what a, a line to be a part of. So they believed and so they spoke, and so they lived, and so they died. And today, at this very moment, they are in heaven, and they are bearing a weight of glory, and they are looking down right now, as it says in Hebrews, and they are saying to us pastors, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. And to avoid losing heart, don't tamper with the Word of God. There are seven other good reasons not to lose heart. Let's pray. So, Father in heaven, it's a costly work. We in America don't bear all the same costs they do in India or Indonesia or Saudi Arabia or Jordan or Turkey or China but we bear our share. Oh God, grant, I pray, that we would not lose heart. You are our hope in life and death. We believe it. We want to minister in that power, and we want to sing it. In Jesus' name.